Yeah, good evening everybody. I'm sorry I couldn't be here last week, but I had Corona for the second time, so I really couldn't come. But um, I will give the lecture another time and I will communicate the date uh, in due time, but of course that is not mandatory. In the first lecture in this series, we concerned ourselves with the Christian conception of God and various ways in which it was represented. Today, we shall look at how the origin of man has been represented. The origin of man and woman in order to address the question of how the sexes are conceptualized it is of central importance to consider the question of their so-called origin. Here you see God the Father creating the world and the stars and the moon and the sun. And here you see the whole story uh, of this first week of creation. This Jewish story of the creation, which was adopted by Christianity, is not, as some may think, the primeval text by excellence. Rather, it is a narrative that progressively took shape over the course of the centuries by means of a long and to a large extent oral tradition and with the passage of time was put, put into written form. Consequently, the story contains contradictions and with regard to something as fundamental as the creation of man, for example, there are even differing versions. I will show you this. There are two different versions in the Bible. It can be assumed that the Jewish and by the same token Christian version is based on much older narratives. In 2014, the Dutch scholars Mario Korpel and Johannes de Moor both from the Protestant Theological University in Amsterdam published their findings of their investigation of clay tablets from Ugarit dating from the 13th century BC. These findings include an early version of the myth of Adam and Eve. Predating by approximately 800 years the version given in the first book of Moses, this Queeniform text in the Ugarit language tells of a battle between the creator god, El, who was a supreme god, and an adversary named Horon, whom El seeks to overthrow. The gods live in a paradisiacal garden in which the tree of life, which gives immortality, also grows. After being banned from the garden, Horon takes on the form of a snake and impregnates the tree of life with venom, turning it into a tree of death that threatens all life on earth. The gods choose one from their midst who is to combat the renegade, but this chosen one named Adam is defeated when Horon, now a snake, bites him, thus divesting him of his immortality. The remaining gods manage to force Horon to uproot the poisonous tree. Although this does not alter the fact that immortality has been lost, life can thus carry on. For Adam, who is now mortal, the sun goddess creates a good wife as a partner. She and Adam, by producing offspring, attain a new kind of immortality, 
So actually, this is becoming what afterwards was Adam and Eve, but as you see, in a very long tradition has uh, changed. In the Jewish Christian tradition, Adam and Eve in Hebrew, Adam means man, and it's related to the word Adama, which signifies earth. The name Eve, derived from Hebrew Chava, meaning life, or she who's endowed with life, is the mother of all the living. Moreover, in the book of Genesis, there are two divergent versions. This is due to the fact that the Old Testament does not only stem from ancient oral traditions, but was also, at various times in its history, written down. What makes for even more confusion is the circumstance that the older version, which dates from around 900 BC, has been aligned with the second version. The older version is referred to as the Yahweh's version, because Yahweh is a word used for God. <coughs> The more recent version was put in writing during the Babylonian exile around 550 BC and is referred to as a priestly code. The mere fact that two versions exist is enough to make one stop and think, how is this possible if what we are dealing with here are irrefutable truths? So it's very important to make clear that you have in the Bible, in the Old Testament, two different versions, and I will read it now to you, these two different versions. The older version, so the Yahweh, uh, Yahweh's text, uh, text written in Israel around 1900 BC, God created Eve from Adam's rib. And I quote now from Genesis 2 verses 21 and 22, then Yahweh God made the man fall into a deep sleep. And while he was asleep, he took one of his ribs and closed the flesh up again forthwith. Yahweh God fashioned the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. This is also how the story is presented in the Carolingian Conval Bible, which you see here, which can certainly be traced back to early Christian versions. <clears throat> so this is the old version. And now I read you the recent version, which is Genesis 1.27. And there you read, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. In Christian theology, and correspondingly in the iconography, the rib version was, almost without exception, the standard version effect that was to have unforeseeable consequences. I will tell you about the consequences, but it's very important that you have in your mind that an alternative could have been possible, also written in the Bible, but which was forgotten. As an example, once again, the Conval Bible, which you see here, is a Carolingian from the ninth century. And for sure, it goes back to early Christian versions, ver versions. God is seen with Adam lying before him. God touches Adam's head with his hands. In the background, we see two assisting angels. God then removes a rib from Adam's side. In the following horizontal panel, God brings Eve to Adam. God warns Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of knowledge. Then we see the fall, which is followed by the expulsion from Eden and life outside paradise, 
paradise, which means work and children. <coughs> Today, the research proceeds on the assumption that in spite of the prohibition of images, Jewish Bible illustra illustrations did in fact exist in the form of scrolls and later books and also mural paintings, such as a completely painted Dua Europol synagogue, which dates from the third century. What I show you now is not the synagogue, but it is, as you can see, the cupola in San Marco in Venice from the 13th century. But one can show definitely that uh, this uh, running narrative style of storytelling possibly uh, is uh, traceable to scroll writing. Also, the San Marco mosaic date from the 13th century, they can certainly be traced back to early Christian sources. And I show you now here, you see the God making Adam out of clay, so he is quite dark. And then you see what I think is a wonderful uh, picture, God giving the soul to Adam. And then now here you see uh, again God taking out the rib of Adam and making Eve out of the rib. Or you have here uh, the example of Hildesheim. Hildesheim, this bronze door from the early 11th century, which is one of the capital works of art in this very early time. And here you have a representation which is very difficult to interpret. One could say God is removing one of Adam's ribs, but you could also say is Adam the standing figure? Even God the Father waking Adam from his sleep? Or is Adam the standing figure and is this God creating Eve? So it's very difficult and one is not sure what it really means. And what you see here is that the, the difference of the sexes are not shown in the body. To quote Hans Martin von Erfa, who wrote what is undoubtedly the most in this study of the iconology of the story of the Genesis, I quote, so far, neither an origin nor parallels for the curious story of the rib have been found, end of quote. And he writes this without further commentary. But it's not enough, however, simply to take note of such an invention, as has been the case in the art history literature. We must ask the question, what does the story signify? I call it a patriarchal reverse muse. Here in the name of religion, laws of nature, are being turned upside down. If you allow me a somewhat free variation on a thought expressed by Roland Barthes, news transform culture into nature. Women, not men, have always been the ones who bear children. In early mystical times, women's very power was her ability to bear children in times when the danger of seeing a genealogical line become extinct was a frequent preoccupation. Women's fertility, her life-giving power, was of the utmost importance. Everything revolved around fertility. Animal fertility, the fertility of the soil, continuance of the family line. Consequently, female deities, and in part particular goddesses of fertility, were of fundamental importance. The creation of Eve from Adam's rib has been used since the beginning of Christian theology as a legitimation of woman's subordination to man. 
already in Paul's epistle to Timothy, this is one of the first uh, Christian um, texts, we read that Adam is God's image and that woman is but the image of man. Christ is the head of man, man is the head of woman. Woman was created for man and not vice versa. Women must subordinate to men. Augustine, the most significant of the church fathers, also concludes from the creation of Eve from Adam's rib that man is to rule and woman is to obey. Eve's situation is aggravated by the fact that she is presented as having played the leading role in the fall of man and ultimately bearing the responsibility for it. In theology, women's subordination has consistently been legitimized as naturally following from the manner of Eve's creation and the fall. During the entire Middle Ages and up until the early modern era, this narrative of an inverse birth, as it were, served as a theological justification and legitimization of woman's inferiority and subordination to man. The basic premise that it establishes is paradigmatic. It places the male principle above the female, and it denies women's power to bestow life. By the way, we have an analogous story in, in antiquity, uh, in the analogous story is the ancient myth of Athena, who was said to have emerged from the head of Zeus. So again, man giving birth to a woman. You remember in the previous lecture, we saw how allergic the church reaction was to the invention of the Vierge Ouvron, that is the shrine Madonna. <clears throat> In the text of the Old Testament, Yahweh takes one of Adam's ribs while he's asleep. Then he closes up the sleeping man's flesh, and from the rib he has taken creates Eve. However, since the end of the 11th century, visual representations depict Adam giving birth to Eve at God the Father's behest, or rather, God the Father extracting from Adam's body a fully formed female figure. To my knowledge, there exists no concrete textual passage that justifies such a representation, not in the Bible. Nevertheless, the Bible moralisé, which you see here, undoubtedly contributed to suggesting such a conceptualization. This form of the Bible emerged in the 13th century and presents the history of salvation in typological form. And the term typology, referring here to the notion that things that occur in the Old Testament are to be seen as prefiguring the New Testament and are to be explained in relation to it. So in this Bible moralisé, which we have very, very common in the Middle Ages, you always have scenes from the Old Testament in an analogy to scenes of the New Testament and to show that the, that the New Testament is right because it was already prefigured in the Old Testament. Thus, just as the church is to be seen as having emerged from Christ, Eve is to be seen as having emerged from Adam. You see this on the right side, on the upper medallions, you see uh, Eve coming out of Adam and the church coming out of Christ. In an early 14th century Jewish Haggadah, we also see Eve rising 
from Adam's body. God, who must never be depicted, is replaced here by an angel. So here you see one of these very few existing Jewish texts which were illustrated and uh, illustrated very similar as Christian texts. But God, of course, is not represented because this was really completely forbidden. So it's an angel or sometimes it's only a hand which you can see. I show you some examples of how this is now represented. And you see here in this, in this miniature, you see uh, God the Father, who's really old man, tearing out Eve, which is like a little baby. Or you have a different kind here in the Vincent's Bible, Eve also being quite small, but fully developed as a real, uh, very nice uh, woman with breasts and clearly to be seen that she's a woman. Or you have here the Milchstadt again, as is dating from the beginning of the 13th century, and then also a painting by Master Bertram dated 1380. Uh, we actually see Eve being formed from Adam's rib. So here he makes, these artists make kind of a combination. They show the rib, but then they show how Eve is coming out of the rib. The first and second versions of the Bible become interwoven and undergo modification. In the older source, God, Yahweh, forms Adam from clay and Eve from Adam's rib. In the later version, Adam and Eve are created by God's word. And here in Monreale, you see uh, that, um, that, that Adam is created by means of a, a beam of light, and Eve is being created from Adam. Creation by verbal and not physical means. And this is in line with the priestly code. Here you have another wonderful miniature of the Book of Hours of Gian Galeazzo Visconti, dating from shortly before 1400, where you also see that Eve is created through the word of God. But you can also have a combination. So here, God uh, is in contact with the left hand and the right hand making a gesture indicating speech or the act of blessing. So it's both. It's physical and also creation by the word. And here you have again very physical uh, examples uh, uh, from uh, Andrea Pisano and then this wonderful relief by Donatello where you really see it's uh, heavy for God the Father to tear out the, the body of Eve from uh, Adam. Adam is uh, mostly shown reclining on the earth, like you have it here, or very seldom, like in Freiburg, you see Adam from behind. In the Renaissance, the emphasis on realistic form in representation becomes problematic. Indeed, there's something paradoxical about seeing a woman just as big as Adam emerging from Adam's side. For this reason, artists of the High Renaissance tend to represent Eve standing behind Adam or rising uh, up from behind him, as you see it here on this wonderful um, relief in Orvieto or on the Golden Doors by um, Ghiberti. And here again, this relief or Michelangelo. Uh, also, um, you, you, you don't see really Eve coming out of, of Adam's body, but it looks like she comes out from behind him. Or you have it uh, in the north, uh, Lucas van Leiden. So the Bible remains sacrosanct. Its veracity was not to be put in question. 
So of course, in the Middle Ages, but also in the, in the uh, modern era, uh, it was impossible to say the Bible is a human invention or something like that. Yeah, that was absolutely impossible. The Bible was the truth. So nevertheless, various passages in the Bible could be in, interpreted in different ways. So you can, there was a, some people tried to interpret it in a different way. The quarrel concerning women's inferiority or equal status, known in the literature as the Querelle des Femmes, a debate that had begun in the late Middle Ages, revolved not only around the central role attributed to Eve in the fall, but also and persistently around this question of women supposedly having been created from men as an afterthought, as it were. So this so-called Querelle des Femmes started with Christine de Pison, a woman writer uh, at the French court. She wrote a book, Le Livre de la Cité des Dames, the book of City of Ladies, and you wouldn't believe it. If you read it, you wouldn't believe it that it, this book is written about 1400 because it's really a proto-feminist writings. And after her, there, there was emerging an entire literary genre called the Querelle des Femmes. And there are some points which were always made. And these women wrote, if women were given the same education as men, they would be their equals. Men hinder women because of the power they possess. And this uh, querelle de femme, this is very difficult to translate. It's like quarrel, yeah, quarrel of uh, women. Um, you have this in many countries. You have it in Italy, you have it in France, in the Netherlands, and in the German spoken countries. There were also men who stood up for women, but very seldom, of course. And you have sometimes real humor come into it. Women authors who make fun about men. And now, um, on our topic, there were reinterpretations. So the woman wrote, first, God created Adam who wasn't quite perfect. It was just, you know, the first trial, and was, Adam wasn't perfect. So then came Eve, God's masterpiece. Or they said, Adam was only made from clay, whereas Eve was made from the finest material. So you see, they didn't take up in question the, the, the truth of the words and the text in the Bible, but they tried to interpret it very differently. The High Middle Ages see a further intensification of the misogyny of this placing of the blame on Eve. Eve was, after all, the main culprit in the fall of man. Here, you see, we have a discussion not only of the creation of Eve, but about her role uh, in the fall of man. Christian theology considers the fall of man to be the core notion of the Old Testament. Uh, in Judaism, this was not the case. The fall has not played such a role. In fact, the Old Testament never actually reverts to it. The fall of man simply provides an explanation for the misery of the world and for human mortality. But now, in Christianity, all that is bad in the world can be explained as resulting from the fall of man. Disease, hunger, death, as well as systems of power and rule. The fall of man was also necessary, because without the fall, there could be no redemption, no history of salvation, no church. In the 12th century, Petrus Comesta was already writing that the serpent had a woman's face. A physical similarity is drawn between the serpent and Eve, because after all, like 
seeks like, as the phrase goes. Petrus Comesto, in effect, establishes the equation Eve equals serpent equals devil. <clears throat> It is in the early 12th century that the serpent with a woman's head begins to make its appearance. And then, of course, again in, in the Bible Moralisé. But this is, in fact, the monstrosity. Women is the devil. And you see here very clearly in this miniature of the Bible Moralisé, you see Eve. And you see the serpent with a head which is very similar to that of Eve, which is definitely a woman. But then you see that this fall makes, makes a redemption possible, and you see Mary with Jesus. And this stays. So you see here the example of Masolino again, Adam and Eve, and the serpent has a woman's head. Or in the Noah Super van der Goose, a dragon like serpent with a female head. Or even Raphael, a serpent with a woman's head. And also Michelangelo. But by contrast, Titian and Rubens, who copied him, here, the serpent has a human head, but it's not that of a woman, it's rather more like that of an infant else. So what is shown here is that the fall has a lot to do with the question of eros and sexuality. But it's not, it's not the identification with a serpent as Eve. In the Renaissance, in the early modern era, the medium of panel painting increasingly encourages the representation of Adam and Eve individually. The fall of man continues to be the main theme. However, the very fact of portraying Adam and Eve individually results in a shift of emphasis from the actual story in the Old Testament to an anthropological focus on the existence of man as such and the existence of woman as such. We see a process of sexualization, erotization taking place, especially in the case of Eve, beginning with the 14th century. In the Middle Ages, Adam and Eve differed only minimally in their physical features. You remember in the Carolingian miniature, for instance, or, in, or in, at the doors of Hildesheim, we couldn't even tell who is Adam and Eve, yeah? because they were looking more or less the same. But the motive of the fall of man came to be the form of representation of the sexes by excellence. The reasons for this are numerous, and they are interconnected. What is of crucial importance here is the new medium of panel painting. This medium take, makes it possible to detach the original human couple of the creation from the actual narrative of the Genesis. Having been detached in this manner, Adam and Eve are able to serve as models in a sense, for man and woman. Panel painting and also graphic art begin to undergo a process of private preemption. A new form of reception emerges. Thus, Adam and Eve are no longer a part of the story of the Genesis, no longer a part of the Bible, a Bible and a story that until now, in the form of book illuminations or mural paintings, had always been presented and received exclusively in an ecclesial or religious context. 
book illumination always combined with a biblical text or theological text, and mural painting always in the church, so it was always clear that it is in a religious uh, context. So, but with panel painting, which was, for instance, also made for the market or graphic art, it's in a profane context and in a private context. So this form of preemption has an isolated, private, and profane character. This development of a profane character is in its turn connected with the general evolution of society, with the formation of cities, and consequently, the possibility and necessity of acquiring profane knowledge, the creation of universities rather than cathedral schools, the emergence of humanism and the shift of focus towards antiquity and, of course, the emergence of an art market. On the other hand, there is a direct relation between the emergence of an urban bourgeoisie and the new meaning that the institution of marriage has begun to acquire. Luther will, will legitimize this new meaning of marriage from a religious point of view and he will religiously legitimize the working couple. Pictorial representations of the fall of man contributed considerably to reshaping the male and female role models, versions that greatly differ from each other, offer viewers a variety of new ways to conceptualize the interaction between the sexes. These are various facets of a dispositive of the sexes that began to take shape around 1500. In here, uh, I back again, uh, Dürer with his uh, very famous engraving. Uh, of course, it is uh, the ideal of the ideal nudity of man and woman. Uh, Adam, which goes back to the concept of Apollo, the Apollo of the Belvedere, and Eve, of course, uh, goes back to the figure of Venus. In the pair of panel paintings by Dürer, we see for the first time a definite erotization, and this will remain. The fall of man being likened to a sexual offense. This was not originally the case. Initially, the entire focus was on the knowledge of good and evil, human likeness to God and disobedience. The relationship between the two figures is emphasized by means of eye direction, gestures, or physical contact. This reinterpretation, which can be dated around 1500, takes place especially in pictorial representations. <clears throat> As is so often the case, a discrepancy can be noticed between theological discourse on the one hand and the production of visual images on the other. Luther considered the essence of the original sin to be not sexuality, but rather, and this is uh, what also Augustine already said, disobedience to God. Nevertheless, there were staunch supporters of Luther, such as Lucas Cranach, who sexualized the fall of man. One is struck by the fact that Eve's role is more constant than that given to Adam. She is portrayed as a passive or active seductress, an object of desire, whereas Adam can take on a variety of roles. Adam seen as a suffering victim, Eve as a seductress. Here you see this very clearly, and you see also the similarity between the snake and Eve, that's kind of a double figure, yes? 
and uh, Adam is uh, standing beside. I show you some other um, examples. Eve, Eve actively uh, going to have an apple, and um, or you see here Lucas van Leiden. Uh, what is interesting here is that this is a whole series by Lucas van Leiden called Weibermacht. This is uh, the power of women. And you see the analogous here, Eve, as a seductress, is like Salome, who actually had to let uh, kill the, uh, John the Baptist. So you see, with these analogies, it's a very hard interpretation of Eve as being the source of all seduction and of all evil. But you, there are very, there are very different kinds of portraying. What is, what stays the same in this time, in the early modern era, is that the fall is sexualized. This is, this stays always the same, and that the role of Eve is, is not changing a lot. But the role of Adam is quite differently, and especially here with Baldon Green. Baldon Green being a German artist who was uh, always um, making things very differently as, as other uh, artists. And you see here um, um, Adam uh, taking uh, not the apple, but the, the breast of, of uh, Eve. And you see uh, drawing by Dürer of uh, the pair from seeing from behind as a loving pair, but typically it's a drawing and not an official um, painting. Or again, here you have uh, Jan Gossert, two uh, drawings uh, which are very, uh, very original, but again, here. Typically, these are drawings and not, not official uh, paintings. But you have also the possibility here to show Adam as an, in a very active role. Uh, here in the, the painting of Gossard, uh, Adam is going to pluck the apple and uh, and you see also with Michelangelo uh, that Adam is given an active role. So uh, Verena, my colleague Verena Krieger wrote a whole article about this uh, new role of Adam as being an active, uh, playing an active role. And here you have some very original uh, examples by Baldwin Green. Uh, here, a panel a painting and, uh, and also a woodcut. Uh, you, you see the, in the woodcut, it shows that the man, Adam, is really playing a negative role. Eve appears to be struggling against him. Baldwin Green is the artist who flats conventions and actually tries out very different ways of treating relations between the sexes. His approach is very profane and has scarcely anything more to do with the biblical uh, story of the fall of man. Um, here you see Adam presenting uh, Eve, or here Eve with a snake and with death. But what you can see is that uh, artists had quite a freedom to, to uh, choose different ways of interpretation. And here you have, again, uh, Philip Gall from a series of uh, Weibermacht, of Power of Woman, where you see the, the analogous situation of Eve and other examples of the power of woman. So that is a very clear, giving Eve a very negative uh, role. And here a very different 
uh, alternative portrayal of Adam and Eve by Rembrandt. And he is uh, the only one actually at that time who is not showing ideal um, nudity, but a nudity which is very human and looking not uh, even almost ugly and old. Very, uh, yeah, very human portrayal of, of Adam and Eve. But in the 19th centuries, uh, you see a complete sexualization and demonization of Eve, who comes to be identified with the figure of the femme fatale. And sometimes she is even portrayed uh, alone without Adam. But now let's take a step backwards. After the expulsion from paradise, Eve gives birth to two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel bring offerings to God. Abel and Lamb kind the fruits of the field. God accepts Abel's offering, but not Cain's. Why? How is it possible that God refuse an offering? Is this meant to be a reminder that the notion of property begins with the cultivation of the land and that inequality comes into the world as a consequence of it? And along with inequality, envy and manslaughter and murder. Uh, the Bible, in principle, um, very similar to ancient myths, tries to explain or state the reasons for historical facts and events, such as the beginning of land cultivation and its consequences, for example, or explain natural phenomena such as the Great Flood, life phenomena such as birth and death, or human traits such as cupidity, envy, and aggression. So when you read the when you read the Old Testament, you will find this this old muse is trying to to understand uh, the world through uh, biblical facts. Whatever the case may be, in the Old Testament, the history of mankind begins with a sacrifice. As a result of sacrifice, as a result of its acceptance in one case and its rejection in the other, violence and murder came into the world. The discourse surrounding the notion of sacrifice is essential to Christianity. There are definitely pagan sources as well ancient rituals, do ut deis. Do ut deis is uh, Latin. It says, I give you something, I give God something that, so that he is good to me and gives me something back. So these are, you will see this in all pagan rituals, you have this, yeah, that you give, that you try to be nice to the God, hoping that they will be nice to you. One of the most frequently depicted stories is that of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham and Sarah could not have children. At Sarah's urging, Abraham begat a son with Sarah's maidservant, Hagar, and named him Ismael. In Islamic tradition, it is predominantly Ismael, who is held to be the legitimate descendant of Abraham. When you look at the internet, you will find this everywhere. So it has an enormous, uh, it, it is very important. When Abraham and Sarah were very old, Sarah was nevertheless able to bear Abraham a son, Isaac. At Sarah's insistence, Hagar and Ismael were banished to the desert. 
God later commands Abraham to sacrifice to him his son Isaac. What kind of God is this? Demanding the sacrifice of one's own child? Total obedience is demanded. Abraham obeys unquestioningly. He takes Isaac along with two servants and goes to the mountain that God indicates to him. I show you here the uh, so-called Elfric's paraphrase on the Pentateuch, very early English manuscript from the early 11th century. He leaves the servants at the foot of the mountain. Isaac has to carry the wood up to the mountain for the sacrifice. Little Isaac then asks Abraham, where is the animal for the sacrifice? When they reach the top of the mountain, the sacrificial fire is lit, and just as Abraham is about to kill his son, an angel intervenes and has Abraham sacrifice a ram instead of his son. This story will be depicted everywhere, again and again. These representations are among the earliest examples of Judeo-Christian art. I show you here the example, the mosaic of the synagogue of Duva Europos from about uh, 255, so very, very early. And you see the candelabrum, and you see the temple facade, and then you see the sacrifice of Isaac. Depiction of this story can also be seen in the very earliest examples of Christian art that exist. In catacombs, for example, such as the catacomb in the Calixus catacomb. In Christianity, Christ is willing to sacrifice himself. And by so doing, to take upon himself the sins of the world. As a result of Christianity, the idea of sacrifice is one that is always present and alive. In late antiquity, around 400, Church Father Augustine systematized the theology of sacrifice. In Augustine's writings, Hellenistic Roman rituals of sacrifice merge with Jewish tradition. According to Augustine, the sacrifice offered for humankind has to be a human sacrifice. He connects Christ's self-sacrifice with original sin, or more specifically, with deliverance from original sin. In the, Eucharist, in the Eucharist, the sacrifice of the mass, the sacrifice is sublimated and spiritualized. Already in early Christianity, Abraham's sacrifice is presented as being analogous to Christ's self-sacrifice. And again, here you see in the Bible Moralise, in the typological representation, uh, you see this very explicit. So you see on the right side, on, on the bottom, the two medallions, you see Christ carrying the cross and eyes are carrying the wood already in form of the cross. So the sacrifice of Isaac begins to appear everywhere, in frescoes, in sculpture, on the exterior, exteriors of churches, in church interiors, in stained glass windows, in craft work generally absolutely everywhere, on absolutely everything, this scene keeps cropping, cropping up. But was this fondness for sacrifice perhaps something that was limited to the Middle Ages? Far from it. In Florence, around the year 1400, a competition was announced for the design of the doors of the baptistery. And the scene 
to be treated was a sacrifice of Isaac. So you see, this was a very important event in Florence, yeah, to make these doors. And the scene that was given by the jury was the sacrifice of Isaac. So you see, it has a, it has, is, it is of such a great importance. And what you see here is Ghiberti and Brunelleschi. And the winner was Ghiberti, who was more successful in winning the committee's favor. Ghiberti is still an artist of the international style of around 1400, um, which makes a, has a much more harmonious um, uh, relief instead of Brunelleschi, who was much more avant-garde, who tried to bring the third dimension in it and made a much more dramatic uh, version. But like it is very often the case, it's not the most avant-gardistic position which wins. So it stays in, in, in the Renaissance. You see here, um, you see her mantegna. And in Baroque art as well, this was among the preferred motives. Here was an opportunity to stage this moment to full, so full of possibilities. Uh, you have this great pathos in the case of the Italian Baroque painter Domenichino. And please notice Isaac's humble pose as he looks up towards heaven. Here the sacrifice is being accepted. But it's not with all artists, is Caravaggio, by contrast, stresses the violence of the act. Also a very unusual detail, the angel is not seen descending from above, but is shown at eye level with Abraham. Nevertheless, this angel, shown in strict profile, gazing at nothing definite and pointing a finger, appears here too to be from another world. Rembrandt, uh, taking his inspiration from his teacher Lastman, in his early panel painting, you see the angel is seen grabbing the father's hand, a very dramatic, uh, and the dagger falling to the ground. The treatment of light increases a dramatic tension. An artist for whom the portrayal of emotion by means of facial expression was of such fundamental importance, Rembrandt here has Abraham cover Isaac's face, leaving the young man's horrification to the viewer's imagination. In the later work, an etching, the Baroque staging of the scene of the scene and the intense lighting have given way to a form of internalization. And I show you, um, at the beginning of the 20th century, a storybook for our little ones. So can you imagine you have um, a storybook for the children showing a father being willing to kill his child? As I told you, the sacrifice of Isaac, but it's now Ismail, is also a motif in Islamic art. And if you would, if you're interested, you can look in the internet. You, you will be astonished to find innumerable um, sources for this. Christianity made sacrifice a central aspect of the religion. Just as a reminder, the most important symbol is the cross, the crucifix. The crucifix, and with it the notion of sacrifice, became Christianity's most important visual symbol. This ancient means of sacrifice, the origins of which date back to early pagan antiquity, persisted throughout the ages and having undergone numerous transformations in the course of Christianity, has continued to thrive in modern times, indeed up to this day, beginning with the French Revolution, 
this essentially religious concept fused with a political concept, producing the notion of sacrifice for one's country. During the French Revolution, the discourse having to do with the notion of sacrifice takes on a profane character, with the state now becoming the benefic beneficiary. <clears throat> The notion is now sacrifice for one's country. The idea of human sacrifice being made for the sake of the modern state was first actually formulated by the French nation, by the French nation, as being a fundamental principle of the new order. In Paris, an hotel de la patrie, altar of the fatherland, was erected in the middle of the Champ de Mars. It was here that on July 14, 1790, the festivities of the Fête de la Fédération reached their climax. On this altar, representatives of the National Guard took a solemn oath to be faithful to the nation, to the Constitution, and to the King who still at that time existed. My country or death. Here, ancient hero myths were being combined with Christian myths of martyrdom. The soldier was expected to see death as a sacrifice both to the Christian God and to la patrie. There was a program of festivities that included a solemn mass celebrated According to military tradition, the intention behind these programs, events, being to, being to connect the church, the king, Louis XVI at that time, the constitution, constitution, and all citizens. The oath of allegiance worn on the altar of the fatherland was a pledge to be willing to go to war for la patrie, an act of resolve that echoed both that of Christian Martyr and that of the hero of antiquity. Here on the altar, state organized killing, which meant both killing and getting killed, was being formally demanded as a sacrifice to be made willingly by the citizens. With the French Revolution, militias took the place of mercenary armies. No longer did soldiers die for money. Instead, their death in war <clears throat> now had to be, in a manner of speaking, morally legitimized as being a sacrifice for their country. One no longer fought for one's king. One now fought for one's people. And for that reason, it was necessary for the imaginary unity of the people to be confirmed by both. In the concept of sacrifice, people are expected to see the necessary motivation for various kinds of vol voluntary renouncement, including the willingness to die but they are also expected to show a willingness to kill. The discourse of sacrifice serves to break resistance against power, especially to that of the state, to bring the individual around to a wishing to the destruction of his or her life and happiness, and to make violence acceptable. The discourse of sacrifice results in a sacralization of violence. The discourse of sacrifice hinders rational critical thinking. A person who willingly partakes in a cult of sacrifice is not only a passive victim, but also a perpetrator. The person being sacrificed shares with the sacrificer the same ideology of sacrifice Seeing in it a kind of fascination, it is not enough to shun the violence of the sacrificer, the violence of the perpetrator. 
It is equally important to avoid being fascinated by the notion of sacrifice, by the very ideology of sacrifice. Of course, uh, when it comes to the relationship between the individual and society, one of the things demanded of the individual, of the individual is one's responsibility for the community. Unselfishness is expected. This, yes, but not sacrifice. In the aftermath of the French Revolution and with the Napoleonic Wars, war memorials began to appear all over Europe. The fusion of the Christian notion of dying a martyr's death and that of sacrificing oneself for one's country constituted the ideological driving force behind the creation of these monuments. And this fusion of notions continues to be operative to this day. As a case in point, 19th century war monuments were always intended to serve as a permanent motivation for future generations to die the death of heroes as generations before them had done. A noteworthy example in this respect is the inscription of Karl Friedrich Schinkel's well-known Kreuzberg monument in Berlin, dated 1818, an inscription that has been copied over and over again ever since. <clears throat> in English, it translates as to the fallen in memoriam, to the living, with acknowledgement to the future generation for emulation. I would like to avoid any misunderstanding. It is both meaningful and necessary to remember those who have died in war, which includes remembering them by means of monuments. The question is how this is done. In what manner are they remembered? And what are the messages conveyed? Essentially, three general tendencies can be observed. One is hawkish and aggressive, characterized by an undaunted will and the glorification of war. Another is of Christian inspiration, Wherever death in battle is likened to Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And the third is typically to show, in most cases, mother often with children mourning those who have been sacrificed. Why isn't the message an appeal to put an end to all forms of war? Why isn't it no more war? I show you some examples. I show you here the Danto Memorial in Hamburg with the inscription, Germany must live even if we must die. Or the War Memorial by Hermann Hoseus in Berlin which is, as you see, a very heroic and very aggressive uh, way of uh, representation. Or in the church in Wallen, uh, you see um, St. George with a dragon. Or here, very typical, you see the analogy, Christ carrying the cross, and the soldier being willing to sacrifice himself and to kill. Or, on the other hand, uh, the, the, these mourning women who always are mourning about their children, but where the, they, uh, they, they would never say no more war, but they, uh, they see the death of the children as a, a fate. After the First and Second World War, war memorials were erected throughout Austria as well. 
when you go make a trip to Austria and you will find in more or less every city and every little village you find these war memorials and they are very similar. You will find no one, not one where there is written no more war. They can be found in nearly every city or town in Austria. People have simply become accustomed to these monuments, which in German are called significantly Kriegerdenkmäler. That is war memorials, or more literally, warrior memorials, and not, for example, Soldatendenkmäler, memorials to soldiers. Rarely is any conscious notice taken of these monuments. But precisely because they've become such an enormous sight, they set the process in motion where the images of the past and things one might imagine about the past occur to the mind subconsciously. In addition, these visual interpretations always have a metaphorical character. When, for example, the mass killing of the First World War is symbolically represented as a nude athlete brandishing a sword, as you saw before with Kurt Hermann Hoseus, or a Saint George figure, we are looking at anachronisms that grotesquely distort the true methods of killing in war. As Gärtner and Rosenberger write, war memorials are opinions, attitudes, historical lies that have become integrated into the fragmentary imagery connected with history. I quote from the book of Gärtner and Rosenberger, who wrote a very good book about these war memorials in Austria. War memorials make manifest a time that had other, has otherwise long since been passed over in silence. However, this very manifestation of historical events contributes to allowing, to allowing suppression to have precedence over knowledge. War memorials refer to things past. They make the past present, but at the same time are institutions that encourage the individual or collective blotting out of many aspects of war and of the entire national socialist system of terror." End of quote. War monuments, in addition to being memorials to those killed in war, are always an interpretation of this form of death and of war, of war itself. And they serve, almost without exception, to rationalize war and by the same token to legitimize it. Moreover, war memorials are always political manifestations in monumental form in the public space. <clears throat> abbreviated interpretations of complex, in the case of the Second World War, horrendous events that now belatedly have been formulated by the survivors, who have their own interests and not by the dead. As the historian Reinhard Korselleck writes, one is supposed to assume that the dead stood for the same cause as those who erected the monuments. But whether it was indeed the same cause is no longer in the power of the dead to decide. Attention is seldom drawn to the fact that Nazi imagery and meta metaphors are often resorted to or that national socialist ideology still finds itself being promoted. In National Socialism, the notion of sacrifice was totalized. In the words of Arno Breker, who was Adolf Hitler's favorite sculpture, I quote, the Aryan's greatness does not lie in his spiritual qualities as such, but rather in the extent to which he is prepared to use all of his abilities to serve the community. His instinct of self-preservation has attained its noblest form when he was willingly subordinated his own self 
to the life of the collectivity and is prepared, if necessary, to sacrifice it." End of quote. After the First World War, many war memorials were erected. After the Second World War, these same monuments were adapted so as to include the years 39 to 45, as well as the names of fallen soldiers. The inscriptions themselves were not revised. Very often one reads, your country will never forget you, or to our heroes who died for their country. The motives are often warlike, soldiers, guns, helmets, laurel wreaths, and oak leaves, symbols of victory and glory. Other monuments emphasize the sacrificial role, a soldier, usually being bewailed by a mother figure. Whatever the form of representation, we must always ask the question, what is not being shown? What is not included in the picture? Who or what has not been chosen as a subject of representation? None of these war memorials name the actual victims, those who were murdered by the Nazis, namely the resistance fighters, the Jews, the Roma, the homosexuals, and so on. The actual fact of the war is in no way put into question. Instead, it is presented as having been a tragic, yes, but also a foreordained necessity. Neither the background to the war, nor its causes, nor opposition to the war is treated as a sin. Nor is any effort made to encourage reflection on these aspects of war. At the end, I want to um, talk about a film I saw a few years ago, perhaps. You have seen him too. It's, it's a film, The Killing of a Sacred Deer, by the Greek filmmaker Yorgos Lantimos, produced in 2017 and released in January of the same year. We see a revival of the theme of sacrifice that is strange, to say the least. Very shortly, I told you the story, a 46-year-old man dies during a heart operation. Years later, his son Martin, now 16 years old, personally contacts the surgeon. It's not clear whether the surgeon had committed an error during the operation. In any case, his guilty conscience leads him to take interest in the boy. He meets him, gives him an expensive watch as a gift, and invites him to his home. His home, opulent, his wife, Nicole Kidman, director of an eye clinic. And they have a young son, and they have a daughter about 13 years old. The son is suddenly unable to walk or eat. Shortly afterwards, the daughter suffers the same symptoms. Martin then makes a prophecy. The situation will only get worse. Eyes will start to bleed. And the children will die if the doctor isn't willing to kill one member of his family. So I can't tell you the whole story of the film. Suffice to say is that in the end, the doctor shoots and kills his own son, after which his daughter recovers her health. This film was selected to compete for the Golden Palm in Cannes. It received critical praise worldwide. Critics compared the tragic plot of the story to ancient myths, and in particular, to that of Agamemnon's sacrifice of Iphigenia, 
Agamemnon, who by killing a deer that belonged to the goddess Artemis, had incited the goddess wrath. I was dumbfounded. I really, I couldn't believe it. How can one possibly take an archaic ritual of sacrifice and uncritically catapult it into the present in the fashion and then inflate it esoterically? Are we supposed to understand here that guilt can be extinguished by the sacrifice of a son? What can possibly be the sense of such irrationalism and of this glorification of sacrifice? I have a plea to make. Come to grips with guilt. Analysis, yes. But sacrifices, no. Neither for a Jewish, nor for a Christian, nor for a Muslim God, and certainly not for esoteric reasons. Thank you. We see you next week.